You are listening to By the Book, because if you don't look at the world through the Bible, you will never see it right. This is Alan Griffith. I want to welcome you to episode 127 of By the Book. Today, we are going to talk about faithful worship in the local church. I wonder if you faithfully worship in a local church. Many, many Christians do not. Uh, We wouldn't expect the unsaved folks to care much about it. Uh, We're told that 31% of the people in our country never attend church. And if they don't know the Lord, I don't know why they would go anyway. We are told that uh, we are dropping in this country 1% of the population per year from going to church, 1% a year. And that goes back, I think the statistics uh, go from 2000 to the present, 2024. Christianity, interestingly enough, or sadly enough, is declining faster than any other religion. Where do you fit in? Where do you fit in? If you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you need to be in church. Now, if you're listening today and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, you need to accept him as your Savior. And you can do that even while this podcast is going on. You can get down on your knees before God, confess to him you are a sinner, you are lost in your sin, and you are putting your trust in Jesus Christ and nobody else and nothing else, trusting that by him going to the cross, shedding his blood, dying on that cross, he was paying for your sin and you are accepting what he did as the only payment for sin that would satisfy the Heavenly Father. Now, you confess that to the Father, and he will forgive you, he will save you, he will give you eternal life. And then, get into a good church. Then you get into a church where you can be baptized by immersion as a testimony of your faith in Christ. Then you can join that church and hopefully become a faithful member, a faithful servant. Now, we're told, again, in statistical information, that 40% or so of people who don't go to church say that they practice their faith in another way. Well, that sounds interesting, doesn't it? Well, I don't go to church, but I practice my faith in another way. And we might ask, what, what, what do you do? Well, I go out in the wilderness. I go for a walk in the woods, I, whatever it might be. But here's what I want you to think about. And again, I don't know where you are in this situation. I hope you are a faithful church member of a good Bible-preaching church. But if you have fallen away and you are not going to church and you think that somehow another way is acceptable, does it matter that God established the church, the body of Christ, and it is God who established the local church? And that's what we're talking about. We should be affiliated with a local Bible-believing church, and we should be faithfully attending, faithfully serving, faithfully involved. Now, there's such things as uh, uh, the recording of services. There's the live streaming of services. And I know with what happened with COVID, many people backed away from church attendance. They locked into the live streaming, and now that's what they're doing. I want you to know live streaming can be a blessing to someone who is sick, someone who cannot get out because of age or whatever else it might be. There is a place for live streaming. I think there is a place for evangelistic 
work through live streaming. But live streaming should not be a substitute for faithful attendance and involvement at your local church. And so I want to talk about that in this episode. And if you're not involved, I hope you determine you're going to get involved. Now, I know what happens. People go to church. They have a problem with the pastor. They have a problem with deacons. They have problems with people. And I've often said when when I see somebody like that and they leave a church, and sometimes there's a legitimate reason to leave a local church, but I always watch if they leave a church, where do they go? Where do they end up? And I want to tell you, it is unfortunately uh, not consistent that people who leave a church for maybe a good reason uh, end up serving faithfully in another good church. Too often they just back away and they don't go anywhere. Well, I want to tell you, God wants you serving, attending, involved in a local church. Now, I want you to know that the church, and when I say that, I'm talking about the spiritual body of Christ. The church started on the day of Pentecost. It's recorded for us in Acts chapter 2. And what makes one a member of the church, a member of the body of Christ, is the work of the Holy Spirit who places us or baptizes us into that spiritual body. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit. The moment you get saved, you are placed into the body of Christ. But you need to be involved in a, in a local church. Now, again, the church, the body of Christ, started on the day of Pentecost. Interestingly, by the way, Pentecost is celebrated on a Sunday, the first day of the week. We worship on the first day of the week in celebration of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the first day of the week, or what we typically call Sunday, I don't like that term because the sun is S-U-N, the sun up in the sky, the sun day, but that's commonly what we call it, and we all use that term from time to time. But uh, I want to say this, the first day of the week, or Sunday, is not the quote-unquote Christian Sabbath. Exodus 31 tells us that the Sabbath was established for Israel. And there is a very special covenant relationship between God and the nation of Israel regarding the Sabbath. But we don't worship on the Sabbath. We don't worship on the Christian Sabbath. We worship on the first day of the week, again, because we're celebrating the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, which occurred on the first day of the week. And I'll emphasize again, the church started on Pentecost, which was the first day of the week. Well, the church was established, and I want you to, if you have your Bible handy, uh, open to the book of Acts chapter 2. We're not going to look at the initial experience of the church, but I want to look at the continuing work of the church once it started. And I pick up in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. We're not going to spend a lot of time here, but I want you to get this idea that while the believers went still into the temple for a time, even for prayer maybe, and certainly for ministry, telling others about Christ, there was a unique beginning of the church, the body of Christ, And very, very quickly, the church began to meet separately from any Jewish experience. Now, as the church went on and and people were out preaching, they were going into synagogues to preach, to win people to Christ, and then they would leave the synagogue and identify with the church. But let me just move 
through some of these things, and I want you to get the flow of what was happening. So in Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 42, which, by the way, is following up Peter's preaching on Pentecost, 3,000 people got saved that day. And verse 42 says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine or teaching and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. There was the church experience starting. It says, and fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, and all that believed were together and had all things common, sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, and every man had need, and they, as every man had need, and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God, having favor with all the people, and listen to it, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. The church started, there was fellowship, there was ministry, it was the functioning of the church, and the church is now beginning to grow. 3,000 saved on that first day, and then daily more and more people were coming to the church. Well, if you get to Acts chapter 4 and 5, you find that there is persecution, two different times of persecution. And then by the time we get to Acts 6 and 7, we find the experience of Stephen. And as you may know, he was the first martyr in the church age. And he went through, along with others, this persecution from the Jews. And now we come to Acts chapter 8. And I want you to listen to it. Verse 1, and Saul was consenting unto his death, that is, under Stephen's death. And at that time, there was a great persecution. Now, there had already been persecution. Again, Acts 4, Acts 5, Acts 6, and 7. But now, in chapter 8, there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. And something unique happens here. It's sad that the persecution came, but the persecution is what God used to send forth more to go out and win others to Christ and get churches started. So I'm in Acts chapter 8, verse 1 again great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad. Listen to where they went. Throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. The apostles weren't scattered. The apostles stayed right there in Jerusalem, but the believers were scattered. And they went throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Let's go down to verse 4. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. And so here's the church at Jerusalem under persecution. People are scattered, but they went everywhere preaching the word. And when they went, you know that as they preached, churches were getting started. And so when we get to Acts chapter 9, the apostle Paul finally gets saved, and then he visits Jerusalem, and he wanted to come to Jerusalem, and he wanted to join himself to the disciples. Uh, they were afraid and so on, and it says that Barnabas took him, brought him to the apostles. They came to understand he truly was saved. It says he was coming 
Uh, he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. He spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus. He disputed against the Gre Grecians, but they went about to slay him. Now listen to it. Which, when the brethren knew, they brought him, that's Paul, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus, verse 31, then had the, listen to it, the churches rest. Now there was more than a church at Jerusalem. Now there were churches that had been established. And listen to where they were. Verse 31, again, then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, were multiplied. So what happened when the believers were scattered from Jerusalem because of the persecution against the church? Well, they left, they went, as the text says, everywhere preaching the gospel. And they're going into the areas of Judea and Samaria and the Galilee. They're going into all those areas. And you know what they're doing? They're preaching the gospel and they're starting local churches. Why? Because that's God's plan. That's God's plan for this age. God wants local churches to be started. God wants local churches to function. God wants believers as members of and in affiliation with local churches. And so I want to ask you, are you involved faithfully as a member of a Bible believing, Bible preaching, local church. If not, you ought to be. And you might have your reason why you don't go or why you don't go anymore. But I want us to face the reality that this is God's plan for this age. This is the church age. And the church is not simply a universal spiritual body, although I believe that is true. God wants that universal spiritual body manifest in local communities, in local churches. Now, let me call your attention to Acts chapter 20 for a moment. I've already take a note of the fact that the church operates and should function on the, the first day of the week. And I've had people call that into question. I remember there was a family when I was pastoring who said they really believed they should worship on Saturday, the Sabbath, and they did, but they wanted to come to our church on Sunday for the fellowship and the preaching. Well, listen, God's intent is for the local church to meet on the first day. Now, if we go to Acts chapter 20, I want to read beginning in verse 6. I want you to take notice of it. Of course, the book of Acts was written by Luke. So when, when we find a we here, the we is Luke, him, including himself and Paul and others. And so in Acts chapter 20 in verse 6, Luke writes, and we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and came unto them to Troas in five days. So it took them five days to get to Troas. Now listen to what Luke said. I have a point I want to make. He said, we came to them, to Troas, in five days, where we abode seven days. So Paul and the company with him get to Troas, and they stay there 
for seven days. Now listen to the next verse, verse 7. And upon the first day of the week. Now what was the first day of the week? Well, that's what we would call Sunday, right? The first day. Upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, you see, the first day of the week was the day the church was meeting. Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, the next day, and he continued his speech until midnight. I want to say a little bit more about that experience, and you probably know about it, but I want to make a point that needs to be understood. They stayed at Troas for seven days. Paul preached on the first day of the week, and then the text says that he was ready to leave on the next day, which we would call Monday, the second day of the week. Now, what's my point? My point is that if Paul was there for seven days, preached on the first day, left on the second day, then he had been there on a Sabbath day, but Paul did not preach on the Sabbath day. He preached on the first day, which again is commonly called Sunday. That's the day of worship, the first day. That's the day that God established with, again, the church starting on the day of Pentecost, which was on a first day of the week. And here's Paul well into the book of Acts, and he is preaching, and he was at Troas over a Sabbath day. He did not do any preaching on that day. He waited until the first day of the week. That's when he did his preaching. And you know what? The text goes on to say, let me read it, verse 7, upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Verse 8, and there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together, and there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. Paul went down, fell upon him, embracing him, said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. When he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till the break of day, so he departed, and they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. You might say, well, why are you telling all that? Well, I want to tell you why. Because people often say, well, you know, we worship in the morning. I don't know why they have an evening service. Where did that ever come from? Well, I want to tell you what. Evidently, back in this day, they had an evening service because Paul was preaching. He preached long, and he preached till midnight. And if that happened in your church, you'd walk out early. But he was preaching, and of course, Eutychus fell out the window, died, but was revived. But what's the point? The point is this. The Bible supports what you and I believe, and that is we are not worshiping on a Christian Sabbath. We worship on the first day of the week. The Word of God is to be preached on the first day of the week, and we are supposed to be a part of local churches. Now, that's what Paul was doing, isn't it? In all of his ministry, he was going around in fulfillment of the Great Commission, and when he got to a city and preached and a number was gathered, people got saved. You know what they did? They started a local church. I read here from Acts chapter 14, Verse 23, it says this, And when they had ordained 
them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. They had been going back through the cities where churches had been started, and now they came back through, as it were, and they were ordaining elders in every church. Now, let me say something. I want to get this clear to you. Anytime you find the term elders, plural, there is always a plurality of churches. Why do I say that? Because there is an elder. The term elder is used interchangeably in the Bible with pastor and bishop. It's all the same guy. You've got churches who have elders and a pastor, or you have churches that have uh, elders, uh, the ruling elders, and then the teaching elder. Listen, the biblical pattern is one man. He is the pastor, he is the elder, he is the bishop. Why those terms? Because they each carry different significance. Bishop is the overseer, pastor is the shepherd, elder speaks of spiritual maturity and such. So here's the churches that Paul was starting, and once they got started, he went back through because they needed leadership, and he would go back through, find men of God, and ordain elders, ordain pastors in that church. Now, if you get to chapter 15, I want to read to you there from verse 36. It says, In some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. Paul thought it not good. There was some contention and so on. But I jump down to verse 40. Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren under the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia doing what? Confirming the churches. Confirming the local churches. If we had time, I would go into a little more depth to point out the fact that Timothy and Titus were not pastors. Timothy and Titus were left in areas to work and labor and to ordain leadership and train men and so on. Local church. Why is this why is it important? Well, in 1 Corinthians 16, Paul makes it clear that giving should be on the first day of the week, that giving would be the tithes and offerings. First day of the week, why? Because that's when they would be going to church. Interestingly enough, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul was writing and brings up terrible sin that was going on in the local church, and he told the church they needed to discipline the man who was in the sin. In other words, the local church has spiritual authority. There needs to be affiliation with the church. You can call it membership. Some people don't like that term, but there has to be formal affiliation with the church, which is in turn why the church had the authority to discipline the man who was in sin. What's the point? The point is that God established the church, the body of Christ. God established through his servants local churches, and that is his plan for this age, the local church. The writer of Hebrews wrote in chapter 10 of his book in verse 25, listen to it, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What is the approaching day? It's the day our Lord Jesus Christ is coming back. And unfortunately, in 
the day of this book, the book of Hebrews and the New Testament times, some were already forsaking the assembling of themselves together. And what a tragedy that there are Christians today, born-again Christians, who are forsaking the assembling of ourselves together in the local church. And you might have your reason why you don't go, but you ought to go because that's God's plan. And don't say, oh, I worship God in my way. God has a plan of worship. God has a program, if you will, and that's kind of a a term I don't like, but it's God's plan. And it's for the local church to exist. And it's for God's people who are saved to be a part of that church, to be involved in it, and through that church to serve and to give and to exhort and to love and to evangelize. That's his plan. Are you faithful? Are you faithful? I hope this podcast is not a substitute for you so you don't go to church and you say, well, I listen to a podcast. Or I hope you're not sitting at home when you don't have to watching a live stream and you're not getting up and going to the local church. You ought to be there because that is the plan of God. Lord bless you. Till next time.